Okay, um, welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, and we are delighted to welcome Professor Emily Bailey, um, Assistant Professor of Christian Traditions and Religions of the Americas um, from Towson University. Um, we have her here with us today. Um, her research focuses on um, religion, religious studies from early America to World War I, um, Christian studies, gender, food, and material culture. Um, and today she is going to talk to us about um, food, religion, and World War II. Her paper is entitled, Food Will Win the War, Dietary Morality and Domestic Sacrifice in the Era of the Great War. Um, so over to you, Emily. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, so I'll share my screen. And I hope that you can hear me well. I snuck into my office today where it's a little quieter than it is at home, but a different microphone. So let me know at any point if it gets too soft and we'll turn things up. Okay, so as Kelly mentioned, I um, studied the intersections of gender and material culture in American Christianity, particularly through a Protestant context. And one of my great loves in material culture is the study of food. Um, so this project considers how Protestant Christian women used food um, as kind of a moral device during the First World War. What does it mean to make a moral food choice? In our 21st century mindset, it might mean making a religiously motivated choice to avoid certain foods like meat. Vegetarianism or veganism could also be based on ethics of sustainability, environmentalism, and compassionate care of animals, which might be defined by free range and pasture range care for some, and compassionate care of animals, or total abstinence from all animal products. Moral food choice for others may be defined by working to ensure that the food needs of all are met. The answer to the question of what constitutes a moral food choice is unquestionably, therefore, a subjective one, tied to personal and cultural beliefs, food ways, and food access. It's likewise unique to different historical moments, as in times of economic hardship or conflict. In the American context, moral eating has taken many forms and has consistently been the product of an amalgamation of intersecting conditions and values. At different points in time, it has been an act of patriotism, an expression of humanitarianism, and an extension of religious conviction. Food ethics at the time of the First World War are no exception. The high tide of Protestant influence, lingering ideals for domestic life, and the centrality of women in it. Changes in American diet and American national efforts to support the war were all at play. Although these are independently exhaustively mined historical topics, their important junctures have been left largely unexplored. In this project, I examine how Protestant women conceived of and employed perceptions about Christian frugality and moral duty to persuade fellow citizens to support the war effort through food production and thrift in the kitchen. The consequential layers of religious influence on widespread civic notions about American nationalism reveal a unique approach to patriotism through women's food work. In the decades leading up to World War I, many American mainline Christians like Methodists and Presbyterians were among the emergent middle class that enjoyed an increasingly diverse and interesting diet. By 1890, nearly half of the American population had gravitated toward urban environments, shifting how many Americans approached the production and consumption of food. While diets for those living in rural settings often remained akin to that of previous generations, local, based on self-sufficiency and sometimes trade, city dwellers were exposed to very different gastronomic experiences. For those who could afford them, mass-produced, manufactured, and imported foods quickly entered the American food marketplace, pushing the boundaries of plain and Puritan fare. The opening of the Erie Canal in upstate New York in 1825 provided access to imported goods like rum and sugar, well, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 allowed for the more efficient transport of perishable goods and produce and meat. One can imagine that it seemed nothing short of miraculous to encounter citrus from far-flung groves while attending an event like the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. In this rapidly expanding and globalized food context, white flour and sugar became new dietary staples, supplanting past reliance on crops like barley and corn. <clears throat> 
I'm concerned about the decreased nutritional value of white baking staples, middle and upper class Americans equated the purity of those goods with affluence and exclusivity so that the new commodities rose to become status symbols of Gilded Age abundance. In the midst of this flourishing culinary experimentation, some Christians like Ellen G. White and her Seventh-day Adventist followers chose to adopt dietary austerities and restrictions as forms of alternative Christian expression. For these key sectarian Christians, the purification of the physical form in preparation for Christ's millennial return was central to expressions of dietary morality. However, as the 19th century came to a close, mainline Christian diets were more reflective of broad social trends in eating. Menus from cookbooks created by Protestant church women in this pre-war period illustrate the bewildering array of bilious offerings on display at community gatherings. In one such example from a Presbyterian church in Michigan in 1878, a suggested luncheon menu includes oyster pie, minced ham sandwiches, chicken croquettes, potatoes, pickles, bread, rolls, waffles, a variety of jellies and sliced fruits, three different types of cake, cookies, macaroons, and ice cream. Whether prepared by the lady of the house or her domestic staff, these were presumably handmade foods for which recipes were provided. The rise of industrialized food production led to even further choices. With the growth and flourishing of American industry in the opening years of the 20th century, an influx of patents for peelers, slicers, or can openers, egg beaters, and hand-cranked ice cream freezers reveals a desire to make domestic food preparation more efficient and food choice more abundant. Convenience foods also gained a foothold in the American marketplace, promising women more time to devote to family and other domestic pursuits. Alongside wheat and sugar, about 90% of the national diet was comprised of pork, beef, corn, dairy products, and vegetable oils by the 19-teens. With new means to procure and prepare food, American Christians were confronted with the challenge of mediating the dissonance between abundant foods of convenience and frugal meals eaten in moderation. This moral dilemma was heightened when the country entered World War I in 1917. In that year, the United States Food Administration was introduced when President Woodrow Wilson appointed future President Herbert Hoover to be director of the nation organization just four days after he joined the president's war team. Their task was twofold, to organize the service and self-denial of the American people so as to supply the allies with foodstuffs during the war and all of Europe after the armistice and to control the distribution of foodstuffs at home. While federal administrations today are inclined toward bureaucracy, the early food administration was predominantly run by volunteers with the help of a small support staff. Hoover expressly counted on the work done by female committees, which in total numbered some 750,000 individuals. Women's Christian groups made up a large portion of these ranks, appealing to the virtues of charity and thrift in their, to, in their fellow church goers to aid the war effort through frugality in the kitchen. From the start of this movement, the American people were called upon to be analogous to the early American Christians in acting as a city upon a hill, aiding the war effort through food efforts that covered every phase from the soil to the stomach while the rest of the world looked on. Food, traditionally relegated to the domestic, became an agent of discipline in the cultivation of a moral Christian self as the United States entered the war. Religious communities enthusiastically and ecumenically joined these efforts, incentivized by the promise of fulfilling an obligation to engage in patriotic service and fueled by the swelling nationalism of the time. This was in part thanks to the religious views of Woodrow Wilson, whose firm footing in the Presbyterian church predisposed his vision of America's place in the war through a mainline Christian lens of moral service. The son of a Presbyterian pastor, as a young man, Wilson wrote in 1876 about the great battlefield of everyday life on which each and every one must enlist either with the followers of Christ or those of Satan. As soldiers in Christ's army, Christian statesmen, like that which he eventually aspired to be, were guardians of morality, fighting under the great banner of love. Though written decades before the war and in a very different stage of Wilson's life, his views about adhering to an almost militant quest for Christian virtue and influence undoubtedly permeated his presidency 
tinting his motives for entering the country into war and his choice of individuals to aid him in that venture. His democratic ideal was supported by the Committee on Public Information, a wartime government propaganda organization established in 1917. According to George Creel, the chairman of the committee, the conflict was a holy war to restore morality, a crusade not merely to rewin the tomb of Christ, but to bring back to earth the rule of right, peace, goodwill to men, and gentleness that Jesus taught. Framing the war as one for the Christian faith and for the Christian God, Creel based his messages on morality and idealism, a sure sign of which buttons were seen as most sensitive to the American psyche. While these views might seem antithetical to present day secularized approaches to state affairs, Creel's stance aligned with Wilson's pre-presidential religious conversion and writings about Christ's army. They were also echoed in popular publications from the era, like the Ladies' Home Journal magazine, in which the October 19 issue included the color image that you see here of Crusaders for Democracy, 13,000 young men studying the Bible with the YMCA while they prepared for war. While the majority of Americans did not overtly define the war as a religious one, it's worth considering that religion is essential to understanding the war, to understanding why people went to war, what they hoped to achieve through war, and why they stayed at war. Even when delving into the long history of the medieval crusades, we encounter layers of political, geographical, and economic factors undergirding the edifice of sacred duty. For some Americans, there was an apocalyptic element in times of conflict, as what were perceived to be the forces of good and evil played out on battlefields, and the victor would be chosen by God. Despite America's late entry into the conflict overseas, efforts to spiritually invest in the war gave Americans a sense of religious agency to be among God's chosen when the cannon fire ceased and armistice was declared. In the summer of 1917, Hoover sent 200,000 letters to Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish religious leaders asking their cooperation in the National Food Conservation Program. Their sense of responsibility as leaders of the people was appealed to, and they were requested to preach on food conservation on Sunday, July 1st, designated as Food Saving Day. Hoover's letters outlined his plan for reaching the women and ministers of the country especially. The strategy included distributing food conservation pledge cards and home guides to Christian churches across America, whether evangelical, liberal, mainline, or otherwise, and encouraged the delivery of sermons that would motivate congregants to adopt food changes at home. As large mainline denominations like the Methodist Episcopal Church had female membership of more than 60% in congregations prior to the war, these materials largely focused on how women could support the war effort at home. With few ordained female ministers in American churches, the male ministers who reigned over the pulpits of most mainline Protestant congregations occupied a complex and perplexing space in these wartime efforts. Falling somewhere between the domestic front occupied by their predominantly female congregations and the secular world of their male counterparts, ministers were exempt from conscription as they had been since the time of the American Civil War. The liminal space that they occupied was especially pronounced when women were called upon to play critical social roles otherwise relegated to men. The consequence was that women wielded quite a bit of power within church communities and were often at the forefront of church efforts to support the war. While Americans were not restricted to the compulsory rationing practices put into place during World War II, Hoover's goal was to enlist nearly as possible, 100% of America's 22 million households and an army that would wholeheartedly support food conservation. As food thrift was left largely to the consciences of American women in this more voluntary system, some Protestant churches went a step beyond wartime pledge cards and implemented the practice of asking members to fill out weekly food report cards based on pledges to adhere to the government's recommendations for rationing. Unlike the pledge cards, which asked for a promise to restrict food choices, when returned to the church each week, the report cards were tallied by committees of women with the objective of demonstrating a united front in actual compliance and regulations. With, of course, a margin of error because you could report whatever you wanted. For women who published domestic advice at the time, like writer Theta Quay Franks, 
the outcome of the war and the international reputation of the nation lay squarely on the shoulders of American women who could strive to adhere to the standards being asked of them. The resulting collective effort by families, farmers, food factories, and even churches helped to reduce food consumption and waste in order to sustain American food supply and send food overseas. In addition to pledge and report cards, the Food Administration circulated home cards to religious communities, which proselytized the gospel of the clean plate. Using Christian language to encourage the elimination of food waste, the cards to be placed in kitchens as dust daily domestic reminders to aid the food war effort made recommendations for substitutions like honey and maple syrup for sweeteners, vegetable oils for fats, and guidance for how to use coal and cooking to use coal and cooking sparingly or wood in its place. It outlined the foods that should be avoided, like wheat, meat, and sugar, and those that were acceptable to eat, like oats, corn, and eggs. Local foods, whether in major cities or agricultural communities, were key to avoiding unnecessary fuel use and whole grains promised better health, as did the fruits of home victory gardens. Eating what was accessible helped women to adhere to the promises to protect the nation's food supplies and avoiding food waste through the gospel of the clean plate emphasized the practicalities of economics and food supply at play. There was a broader sense as well of social ethics. High food prices at home and food shortages abroad confirmed the moral mandate to rethink all of the rules by which Americans previously ate. The religiocentrism of American Protestant Christianity was apparent in many wartime food publications, like pledge cards, as is evidenced by those printed for Jewish communities to guide them to collectively track their food patterns, like their Christian neighbors. Not only were the food cards filled with incorrect words and translations, but they had the oath taker promise to try to eat shellfish, a serious violation of the orthodox dietary laws, which most Yiddish speakers followed. You see it as well here, posters that were translated, um, really calling on immigrant communities to uh, enact their patriotism through food choices, and these were also targeted to religious communities. Despite the Food Administration's missteps with interreligious publications, they continued to strive to gain new converts for their wartime food causes by attempting to recruit from the influx of immigrants with the promise of providing nationalism, uh, a new patriotic form of being an American through particularly food practices. In states like New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, the preponderance of new Christians and new citizens arrived from Southern and Eastern Europe with large numbers of Catholics alongside Jewish immigrants at the time. They were subject to heightened pressures to change their ways, including their food ways, by an Americanization process that was heightened by the war. Given the religious pluralism of the era, it would be a misrepresentation to claim that Protestant ideals were hegemonic for American ideals in the early 20th century. However, it would also be a miss to ignore the centrality of those Christian, Protestant Christian views in American life and culture at the time. Despite the role of the Food Administration as a non-religious entity, it often employed language of Christianity in its documents. The prevailing Christian culture was dominant in ways in which frugality and food conservation were advertised to the American public throughout its participation in the war. This one's a little grainy, um, but this is the seal of the Christian Endeavor Society, and it says, for Christ and for the church. One of the most illustrative examples of the joint efforts of wartime government and church food control took place in 1918 when the Food Administration collaborated with the non-denominational Christian Endeavor Society to create the wartime cookbook, Food Will Win the War, from which all proceeds were promised to wartime need. Founded in 1881 by the Reverend Francis E. Clark, a congregational minister from Maine, the Endeavor Society became a national interdenominational co-ed organization for Christian youth. In the DC area, period newspapers show that Baptist, Lutheran, Congregational, and Presbyterian churches supported Endeavor activities, including the construction of the wartime cookbook by the Church of the Covenant. 
In the book, women were asked to transform their kitchens into places where food was thoughtfully chosen and prepared as an expression of Christian patriotism. Ration friendly recipes were given symbolic names to foster feelings of nationalism, like Hoover cakes and Old Glory bread. The book encouraged a regimented schedule of change, a sort of dietary conversion experience that families could undertake in order to fill, fill their obligations to the nation. Meticulously created food schedules were interspersed in the text alongside inspirational verses. In one selection entitled To the Housewife, the significance of women's participation on the domestic front is underscored in a poem about creative wartime meal substitutions. It reads, you cannot fight across the seas then organize a corps of those expert or gas and flame for food will win the war. Your country needs your super bit, receive a new commission. Instead of meat six times a week, more often go efficient. Count sacrifice of privilege, the Kaiser to dislodge and substitute for fat and oils, some form of camouflage. A relatively new genre of American publishing, charitable cookbooks like the wartime cookbook grew in popularity after the Civil War. As Anne Bauer, Lynn Ireland, and Janet Theothano have contended, these historical cookbooks offer us exceptional glimpses into women's homes, communities, and food ways. Despite being published as a government issued text, the wartime cookbook reflects this, having been compiled by the Christian Endeavor Society under the direction of Mrs. Margaret Walton and Mrs. Mildred Clee as a snapshot of expectations for Christian women's kitchen contributions during the war. In a time when women's contributions were largely concentrated in the home, Books like the wartime cookbook supported that domestic efforts were as selfless and prized as those of men fighting on the front. Men's national service guarded American freedom and democracy. Women's national service protected the food supply of the nation, keeping Americans fed while also sending much needed food supplies to the American soldiers and allies whose farmland had been uh, turned into battlefields overseas. Although many women, Christian and otherwise, extended their wartime volunteerism to organizations like the American Red Cross and YWCA, the Food Administration and Christian Endeavor Society contended that social efforts were commendable, but that the roots of true Christian patriotism and self-sacrifice needed to be sowed first in the home. As kitchen soldiers, women were fighting for all women, all children, all soldiers of the Allies, for democracy everywhere. Though largely overseen by government entities, these efforts frequently had women at the helm, likely as models for other women to follow. The picture you see here is of trained social worker, police lieutenant, suffragist, and head of the Food Administration Lecture Bureau, Mina C. Van Winkle who was chosen by Hoover as a public spokeswoman for home efforts during the war. Here, she sports a special uniform, similar to that encouraged by the Food Administration through magazines like Good Housekeeping in 1917. As professional homemakers, women could choose the outfit as a badge of loyalty and a symbol of practical patriotism, serving as a tangible reminder of their role as citizen soldiers on the literal home front. Food waste and conservation were persistent topics of discussion in a campaign of dietary propaganda for this domestic army, in which the Food Administration issued persuasive wartime posters about the influence that home economies could play in the conflict. The posters promoted thrift and rationing as not only patriotic duties, but Christian moral imperatives. This example, affirms the perception of many Christians that American morality was solidly grounded in their faith as it reminds all women through Christocentric language that during war, food waste was the greatest crime in Christendom and that American resources should be guarded and shared willingly and unselfishly. Food conservation is elevated here from the status of the mundane to the sacred in posters that make everyday acts like eating salvational. To waste food in the comfort of one's home while soldiers and allies starved on the distant battlefront was sinful committing a moral crime against one's fellow man and against God. Demonstrative of 
progressive era attempts at frugality and equality, this wartime approach to dietary reform was particularly upheld by Christians adhering to the social gospel as one that emphasized the needs of the other over selfish desires. Under the guidance of Christian progressives like Baptist theologian Walter Rauschenbusch, a prevailing wartime Christian perspective was that sin was fundamentally selfishness and that the collection of public sins of selfishness caused, caused communal distance from the kingdom of God. To restore the moral order of God's kingdom was to employ selflessness, frugality, and a moral approach to one's community in the world, which during the war encompassed the production, use, and distribution of food. As upper and middle class women were the most likely to join benevolent societies because they enjoyed the time and means to do so, benevolence and reform activities became distinguishing characteristics of reforming Christian virtue for American women who adhered to the social gospel message. Despite the late entrance of the US into the war, the conflict made it apparent that agricultural and food supply were key in maintaining America's position as a vital player in 20th century geopolitics. While the Food Administration concentrated its efforts on women's domestic contributions to the war, other organizations called on women to bolster the nation's food supplies through agricultural work. In the Food Administration's Food and War, a textbook for college classes published in 1918, women especially were asked to consider how all questions about the war now center on food, its production, its distribution, its use, its conservation. The more you know about these things, the more valuable you will be and the greater will be your service to humanity. With more than 20,000 farmerettes deployed to rural America to support farming from 1917 to 1919, the Win Women's Land Army of America ensured that more than 6 million farms in the United States, alongside an additional 3 million home gardens planted by 1917, would keep the nation fed while maintaining a lead in world food production. Inspired by similar organizations in Britain, the WLA established camps across America, which were financially backed by local assemblies like civic clubs, the YWCA's land service committee, and women's colleges. Though hugely influential in American wartime efforts, the WLA was embraced by Christian communities to varying degrees. Though the YWCA buoyed the uh, women's land army cause, the relationship between Christian and secular organizations was sometimes at odds when it came to women's war work outside of the home, despite ultimately endeavoring for the same kinds of goals. As Elaine F. Weiss notes in her comprehensive study of the Women's Land Army, the, w, the YWCA had a clear image of itself as a Christian force for the working girls' protection and betterment, insisting on women's war work that fell within these distinct lines. Life in women's land army camps for single women was brought under close scrutiny by groups like the YWCA, which were concerned about fostering a moral atmosphere for women as they lived away from their homes and families often for the first time. These fears about female morality were tied to the dominant ideas about appropriate gender roles that originated from within the white Protestant and predominantly middle-class culture in the years leading up to the war. As Barbara Walter contends in her well-known analysis of the cult of true womanhood or cult of domesticity, 19th century women's lives were guided by four attributes that became standards for American women, piety, purity, domesticity, and submissiveness. Aligned with the Protestant culture of the time, which was quite dominant, these qualities became equated with Christian virtue so that it was through women's domestic duties, including their work in the kitchen and their religious devotion that they were made complete. But as the century came to a close, women began to employ their moral agency in an effort to mobilize for greater social and civic empowerment, an endeavor that was fortified by their temperance and suffrage causes and later by the work that they were tasked with during the war, like in the case of the Women's Land Army. On the cusp of American female suffrage, women also voiced concerns about who should have control of female-driven wartime causes like the Women's Land Army. In 1918, prominent scientist Dr. Ida Ogilvie suggested that the WLA was the first institution founded by and for women in America for the work that women can do, not modeled on any pre-existing institution for men nor made by men for what they think that women need. Unlike the push 
for domestic work on the part of the federally run food administration, the WLA allowed for a degree of freedom and a change of scenery for American women as they supported their country's role in the war, but not without raising questions about the appropriateness of women doing labor that had traditionally been associated with men. Even supporters of women's equal abilities to work for their country had doubts about the long-term applications of roles for women outside of the home, particularly in agricultural causes during the war. As the consultant in industrial hygiene for the US Public Health Service, Dr. W. Gilman Thompson contended at the end of the war, the essential facts are that women can do men's heavy work with substantially equal output without any disturbance of the particular industry and when guided by proper conditions without detriment to their health. How far and how long, however, they ought to do it in an emergency even arising from war is to be decided upon different grounds. Undoubtedly, mainstream Christians, mainstream Americans still held relatively conservative views about women's gendered work outside of emergency situations like war. These new perspectives about women and their role in society began to foment social unrest in the early 20th century, as the boundaries of what constituted femininity and women's work were stretched by feminist suffragists and suffragettes, leaving Americans with more conservative views of gender, speculating about the social ramifications of shifting norms. In a Christian culture that had upheld women as the moral pillars of their homes and communities for more than a century, men and women alike were fearful about the disintegration of moral and domestic order should women step further into the world and outside of the home. The working women had long extended into that sphere, middle and upper class women also pushed their boundaries when duty called. Female suffrage could not come to fruition until after the war, but women's responsibilities during the conflict, like maintaining America's food supply, allayed fears and ultimately acted as a gateway to the political economy for American women. The image that you see here is a 1909 anti-suffrage postcard called the Male Madonna. It's indicative of the views that many mainstream Christians held about traditional gendered responsibilities and fears about what would happen when women left households during situations like the war. This project is still very much one in progress, but I will leave you with a couple of concluding thoughts. When considering dietary morality, the politics of commensality in circumstances like war are rarely simple. American food assistance overseas continued well into the 1920s, though the concentration of the cause shifted after the war. Food was shared with allied countries and central powers alike, including with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Still holding the dietary and moral compass, American Christian women's organizations continue to support and engage in these efforts on the domestic front, extending food charity to those formerly thought of as enemies. Organizations like the WLA, however, dissolved shortly after the war as women went back into the domestic home front. For socially minded denominations clinging to enduring progressive era efforts, of uh, welfare and reform, it was in service to what they believed to be God's desires for holiness and love that sustained an ongoing dialectic of social religion. Before being rebranded as the American Relief Administration in 1919, the Food Administration helped to deliver an incredible 23 million metric tons of food to countries with food systems ravaged by the war. When the conflict had ended, Hoover paid tribute to the millions of farmers and women, without whose patriotic devotion and self-sacrifice, the winning of the war would have been impossible. This was not the first time that Americans had been asked to serve their nation by being prudent in their kitchens, and it would not be the last. Labor had shifted in domestic economies from the American Revolution and would continue to do so through the Second World War, as women were tasked with preserving households, communities, businesses, and religious institutions when men were called to the battlefront. Thank you so much, Emily. That was so exciting. And so um, so many, I could draw so many links to World War II, um, but I want to open it up to questions. Um, 
And could you just stop sharing your screen so then we can sort of, sorry about that. Thanks. Brilliant. Um, all right, so let's have questions for Emily. Um, you can either post them in the chat or you can use the raise hand function. Um, does anybody want to kick us off? Why don't I um, um, take chair's privilege then and um, ask you a question about um, uh, uh, the issue of vegetarianism. I know sometimes in religious, um, different religious um, groups, uh, vegetarianism is a sort of part of this idea of morality. Um, and I wondered if um, that got strengthened in the war because the, in the war they're trying to, you know, eat less meat and things like that, which feeds into this idea of vegetarianism. So I wonder if you could speak a bit about that, if whatever you'd like to say. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so the vegetarian cause was um, surprisingly a, a Christian cause in America in the century before um, the war. So you had folks uh, in the vegetarian society um, coming over from um, England to America and influencing uh, individuals like Sylvester Graham and then ultimately sort of a next